and I will welcome everyone to the fourth installment of part three. And um, I would like to remind everyone that you will be muted during the session. If you have a question, make sure you like type it into the uh, chat box or something or write it down so that you don't uh, forget it. And then at the end, we will have a Q&A and you can ask Fred um, any questions you have. And um, with that, I will turn it over to Fred. Go ahead, Fred. Well, hello, everybody. And I hope that uh, that as much as possible, everybody's health is well. Uh, we've learned a, a little bit about uh, one of our members having, or really two of our members testing positively for the virus. And uh, uh, I'm proud to report that, uh, that both of them are getting better. One is getting better and one really uh, is her old cheerful self. So uh, I hope everything works well for them and everybody else. Today, um, as we're entering the cheerful holiday season, uh, I have a lecture based on one of the less cheerful uh, elements of the American Civil War and one of the more controversial elements, even to this very day, of the American Civil War. And that's the role that uh, paroles and prison camps played during that conflict. Um, we're all a little bit familiar with the most infamous of all of the uh, prison camps, which of course was at Andersonville in Georgia, which is not too far north of the, uh, of the border with Florida. And um, it was justly designated as infamous. Uh, at its peak, this prison camp that was built to house 10,000 people housed nearly 30,000 people. And uh, all total 45,000 people went through Andersonville and of that number, 13,000 died, 13,000 died. And since I was in a previous conversation recently uh, discussing ancestors, uh, I will mention the one ancestor that I'm familiar with. And that was a man named Richard Bailey, who was a uh, hard scrabble young man uh, in West Tennessee, but a part of West Tennessee that was uh, Piney Woods which means basically uh, impoverished. And his people and his neighborhood uh, actually favored the Union. Most people in his neighborhood joined what was called the 10th Tennessee Calvary Union. And, uh, and he did not, for whatever reason, and I'll never know the reason. Instead, he, uh, he walked about 30 miles down to Corinth, Mississippi, and he joined the Union Army there and served of all things in the 7th Kansas Cavalry, which was a bunch of groups that were the old Jayhawkers and abolitionists. Uh, I'm happy that he did not join the Tennessee Cavalry because all of those men went to Andersonville and 40% uh, and of those men did not return home. They died at Andersonville, uh, which means had my ancestor joined the 10th Tennessee Cavalry with his neighbors, uh, we may not very well be having this lecture today. Uh, and on that, we all have this very thin strain in our background where any slight change could very well have altered everything that has come to pass. Well, with those cheery thoughts, let's, uh, let's talk a bit about uh, prison camps. And uh, they were a place of uh, tremendous inhumanity, no question about it. And that's what leads to the controversy. Because uh, in the North, when the Civil War was over with, uh, there was a great deal of recrimination toward the South as it related to the Andersonville prison. And in fact, the commander at Andersonville, uh, a captain, was executed for war crimes, uh, which most historians say was terribly unjust, that he didn't actually commit any war crimes. It's just that the conditions in his camps, which I'll explain later, uh, were so bad that somebody needed to be punished and he became the symbolic punished person. And among the people who participated in the military he is the only person executed after the Civil War. Now, obviously the assassins of Abraham Lincoln were executed, but, uh, but of all the combatants, 
and all of the things that happened. And there were war crimes during the Civil War, actual real war crimes. Um, but he was the only person executed uh, in connection with his service to either the Union or Confederate cause. And he, of course, was to the Confederate cause. And therein, because of that, um, and because of the uh, use of Andersonville as a condemnation of the South, Southern partisans in turn, being very defensive, have uh, waggled their finger and said, wait a minute, uh, the Northern prison camps were just as bad as the Southern prison camp. And they were largely correct in saying that. Uh, Elmira in New York, uh, prison camp uh, has sometimes been referred to as the um, uh, the Andersonville of the North, and um, and again, great deal of inhumanity, suffering, starvation, disease, uh, many other things that are associated with prison camps happened at Elmira. But the reality is that it, at neither Elmira nor Andersonville was the inhumanity for the most part intentional. And I want to emphasize that very carefully. We're going to look at prison camps. And these prison camps have terrible reputations, justly deserved. But, uh, but this was not, for lack of a better term, uh, the South taking rep um, retribution against Northern prisoners or the North taking retribution against Southern prisoners. The the, what happened in the prison camps fundamentally was that uh, this was a new thing. Prison camps of this sort had not existed in previous wars. And uh, the knowledge of what happens to people in a POW camp, the knowledge possessed by the North, <clears throat> the knowledge possessed by the South, was inadequate to deal with the situation. And so what we're really looking at is vast numbers of men pinned up for many weeks, months, and occasionally years at a time by people who did not understand the physiological things that happened to people, the psychological things that happened to people. They didn't understand any of that. And the result was a tremendous disaster in both North, the North and in the South. Well, Northern and Southern prison camps were characterized by overcrowding, poor sanitation, food shortages, filth and disease, starvation and death and more. And um, these are things that today we understand. Um, we're appalled and justly so at the Japanese prison camps uh, in World War II and, uh, uh, and the terrible treatment that they gave to prisoners and they're condemned, justly condemned for what they did because by that time, we had the Geneva Convention. The Japanese were not part of it. The Russians were not part of it. But, uh, but the Geneva Convention discussed exactly what was supposed to happen to people in prison camps. And also by that time, by World War II, we understood to a great extent the psychology of men pinned together for long periods of time, idle and unable to, uh, to adjust to the world around them. We understood the germ theory by that time. We had a much better concept of nutrition by World War II. As a result, there was a great deal of humanity in most prison camps on both sides, both the, uh, uh, the Allied and the Axis sides during World War II. By contrast, the prison camps that developed during the American Civil War approached the atrocities, or at least the conditions, almost equivalent to what you saw in the uh, in the Jewish and other political prisoner concentration camps in Germany in World War II. And so let's proceed to, to examine what was happening. There were over 150 prison camps during the Civil War. Now, most of these were temporary and most of them were holding camps until uh, soldiers could be sent either to the North or to the South to the larger prison camps. And, uh, and we'll take a look at some of those uh, major prison camps. But uh, as you look at what's happening during the Civil War, here's a few statistics that might uh, catch your attention. 
approximately 3.8 million men served in a combat uh, as combatants during the American Civil War. Um, approximately twice as many in the North as in the South, or about two and a half times as many in the North as in the South. Of those almost 4 million people, 3.8 million, one out of every 10, in fact, slightly more than one out of every 10, would experience a surrender and prison situation. In other words, there is estimated, and I want to emphasize estimated, because figures on prison camps are probably the worst figures that you can get as it relates to the Civil War. In other words, these are best estimates that we can make with the records that have survived estimates. But, uh, but approximately 400,000 men suffered having been captured and experiencing time in a prison camp during the American Civil War. Of those 400,000 men, somewhere between 46,000 and 56,000 died due to the conditions that existed in those prison camps. Uh, southern prison camps, uh, the death rate was higher than northern prison camps. Uh, reasonable estimates suggest that about 12% of the uh, southern soldiers that ended up in northern prison camps perished. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, the figure rose to about 18% uh, of those northerners, those uh, Union soldiers that ended up in southern prison camps, perished, died as the, uh, in the course of the experience. And that's not talking about everything else that happened. Because in fact, um, simply saying how many people died, and that's a horrendous number that passed away, uh, doesn't even begin to explain the, uh, the nature of uh, what happened in these camps during that conflict. I, um, my first book was because I had stumbled upon something called the Tennessee Civil War Veterans Questionnaires. And uh, in my study, I looked at 1,200 of the men that filled out the questionnaire. There were a total of 1,648 but some of them were Union soldiers. Some of them didn't fit a couple of categories I had. I wanted men who had lived in Tennessee before the Civil War. And there were about 200 men who had lived elsewhere, but moved to Tennessee after the war. So I eliminated them. And then there were a handful, about 20 or so, where the soldiers uh, didn't say a whole lot on their questionnaires. These were elderly men uh, near the end of life. And basically they signed their questionnaire, but. They passed away before they filled it out, but somebody sent it back in anyway. So I looked at a little over 1,200 men. And one of the things that I noted as I looked at it, that the men who were the most bitter, the men who seemed to have adjusted the least well to the post-war civil war, uh, post-war conflict, were consistently men who had experienced prison camps that there was something about that prison camp experience that blotted, blighted these men for the, the entirety of the rest of their lives, okay? Um, as one soldier that I looked at said, a fellow by the name of uh, Joseph E. Riley, and oh, by the way, um, I just said that all these men were blighted. Um, Joseph E. Riley, I got to know these men fairly well in, in a sense, um, probably is the one person out of that uh, 1,200 that I wrote about that I would really love to sit down and spend some hours with. Um, he actually had a rather interesting and upbeat personality. But as he observed, serving in a prison camp, and he was at Brock Island Prison, which is uh, on the Mississippi River just off the, uh, the bank of Illinois, he said it was the hardest service ever rendered by a soldier the hardest service ever rendered by a soldier. And there's a, another fellow by the name of Joseph B. Felton, who I've come to, uh, to know more recently. Uh, Joseph B. Felton was with the 14th Volunteer Infantry, West Virginia. Therefore, he was a Union soldier. And he ended up in Nangersonville. And uh, I've been privileged to look at his diary. I'll explain that in a moment. But uh, Here's his entry. 
uh, for uh, the 4th of July in 1864. He was concerned about rain, he was concerned about food, and he was concerned about everything that was going on around him. And on the 4th of July, 1864, here's what he said. We had a very hard rain here today, thunder too. This is the horriblest 4th of July I ever passed in my life. Think about that. Here it is, the, the national holiday, the 4th of July. And here is a, a soldier, a Union soldier, for whom the 4th of July has special meaning in the context of the Civil War. But in his case, he is literally sitting in the mud without shelter. Other men are lying around him in the same condition. And he has to write down, we've had a very hard rain today, thunder too. This is the horriblest 4th of July I ever passed in my life. That's what we're going to talk about today. I need a little help in talking about it. So what I've done is I've invited uh, some people who know prison camps and the Civil War prison camps far better than I do to, to participate in our uh, program today. Uh, several of them are uh, old friends of mine, very old friends of mine. In fact, they passed away long before I was born. But uh, they're the men that filled out the Tennessee Civil War Veterans Questionnaires. And um, uh, as I said before, there were 1,648 of these, uh, only two of whom I actually have pictures of. One of them is Overton County's Felix Bilbrey, and then another uh, when he was a young man in the Civil War. And another is John Patton Stribling, uh, who was from Madison County, that's where Jackson, Tennessee is. And um, I have a picture of him where he was celebrating his 100th birthday as the oldest living surviving Confederate veteran in, um, in Madison County, Tennessee. And, uh, and yes, that uh, rather strange looking figure talking about it um, is um, what I looked like when I was friends with those men. Uh, the ravages of time have not been particularly good to me. Um, so who was Joseph B. Felton? Well, Joseph B. Felton was from West Virginia, a common farmer, uh, a man who had limited education, but then everybody else did too, for the most part. And um, when you see me writing about these men, uh, the spelling that you see and the grammar that you will see is exactly the way that these men wrote. And I hasten to add exactly the way these men talked. Uh, they all learned to write phonetically, and so you can almost hear them talking when you read exactly what they wrote. And, uh, and Felton began his diary on the first day of uh, January of 19, 1864, not 1964, but 1864. And here's what he says. <clears throat> Remember, first day of January, 1864, opening entry in his little diary. Today is the first day of the new year. I have been in the service 16 and a half months, but I haven't seen a wild rebel yet. Almighty God knows what I will have, uh, have to go through in the next 20 months. He'd been in the service for 16 months. On the first day of January, 1864, Felton was 17 years old. He will be 18 years old on the seventh day of January, 1864. In other words, he entered the service of the Union Army when he was in his mid 16th year. A young man, a teenager, a person that today we might like drive, but we wouldn't let vote. A person who today uh, would still be in high school. But here he was from the age of 16 and now he's almost 18 when he in, entered this entry into his diary. And uh, he had not yet even been in a battle after 16 months. And he has to ask himself, almighty God knows what I have to go through in the next 20 months. Perhaps if he had known what he would have to go through, that he would end up in Andersonville prison and all the things that he would see and experience in Andersonville prison uh, it may very well be that he would have considered 
uh, going elsewhere in the context of, of his life. So when he made that entry, he had no one idea what was going to happen in the future. But we can read his diary and we'll know what happened. And so I'd like to give, as I say here, a tip of the hat and thanks to a man named Alan Prickett, uh, Pickett, uh, who lives here in Abilene and is a good guy, um, and who kindly gave me access to his great grandfather's account of a Union soldier's life, including the months that he's experienced as a prisoner in the infamous Andersonville prison camp. So where shall we begin? Well, let's begin with uh, the basic problem of what you do to people or do with people who surrender because surrendering uh, is honorable in our culture. Uh, the Japanese culture in World War II, surrendering was not honorable and that's why they fought to the death. And that's why they treated prisoners of war so badly. But in our culture, we believe and European culture believes that uh, when you fought the good fight, when you have no other option, uh, the humane thing to do, both for you and for your enemy, is to surrender. And then there's some expectations that come from that. In the opening of the American Civil War, however, the expectation was not prison camp. Uh, there had been a prison experience in American history, but it goes back to the American Revolution. And uh, one of the things that you don't often read about as it relates to the American Revo uh, Revolution is how the British treated, <clears throat> and we treated as well, prisoners of war. Uh, for example, in New York Harbor, which the British occupied, uh, they took old ships that were really no longer worth, worth or even able to cross the ocean, and they, trained, they made them into what were called prison hulks and prisoners were stuffed on the board those. And um, something like 60% of the prisoners that were kept in those uh, prison holds, American prisoners, American Patriot prisoners, uh, died on those prison holds. And uh, for many years, they were buried along the shores of New York City. But uh, from my understanding, much of where they were buried has long since eroded away and so their bodies uh, have literally, what's left of their bodies been washed into the Atlantic Ocean. On the other hand, the Americans uh, kept British prisoners in Connecticut. And in Connecticut, there were a series of lead mines, very deep uh, lead mines. And, um, and British prisoners were kept in there and they spent months uh, in agony, just as the Americans on uh, the American Patriots on the boats spent agony. Uh, and dying in large numbers, never seeing the light of day, just being kept in a dark hole deep in those prison, ca uh, prison caverns. So you had uh, prison hulks and prison caverns. And both the British and the Americans, after all of that experience, realized that that was an inhumane thing. And so when the War of 1812 occurred, the Americans and the British came to an understanding and it was called paroling. That when you captured an enemy combatant, that after a period of time, the combatant would be given a sheet of paper, which he would sign and he would take a pledge that uh, he would be paroled. That is to say, he would be turned free and allowed usually to return home until he was exchanged uh, rank for rank, soldier for soldier, uh, in a rather complicated system, but it was called paroling. And that system worked so well in terms of humanity that when the United States engaged in war with Mexico in the 1840s, uh, again, the government of Mexico and the government of the United States adopted almost exactly the same parole policy that the United States and Great Britain had adopted. And in terms of the mentality and expectations when the American Civil War developed, the assumption was that, uh, that again, we would engage in paroling. However, there was a bit of a problem as it relates to the American Civil War. And um, there is no real name given to it by anyone. So I simply call it the Lincoln Dilemma. 
And uh, the Lincoln dilemma was this. Lincoln, being a lawyer, as well as president of the United States, uh, Lincoln defined the American Civil War as uh, an internal conflict. Now, he ran into some legal problems when he declared a blockade. You might remember that because you cannot blockade your own country. And so the British immediately interpreted that as Lincoln's recognition of the Confederacy and, uh, and declared that the Confederate and the, the English government declared the Confederacy to be a belligerent that gave to the Confederacy certain rights um, and certain um, abilities of the English to deal with the situation that Lincoln was trying to prevent because he was saying, no, it's a domestic conflict and any outside interference is interfering with the domestic conflict. So here's the dilemma. If Lincoln negotiated with the Confederacy to establish a system of paroling, he will have, and the, the legal term is uh, de facto, which in Latin is, you can see what it means, it simply means it is the fact, the reality, um, it would be de facto recognition of the Confederacy, which he refused to do. That was one of the major points. And it had to do with foreign affairs. If he recognized the Confederacy, then that gave the Confederacy status and possible recognition by other countries. So Lincoln could not, from his standpoint, a legal standpoint, uh, he could not uh, uh, allow a formal, notice they use the word formal, a formal process of paroling. And that's gonna cause a great deal of suffering uh, to, uh, to Union and Confederate prisoners. So let's proceed with this. What Lincoln did allow, uh, because it was necessary, was a certain degree of informal paroling. In other words, not anything that, that uh, would reach the status of being legal, but rather something that would uh, satisfy the need to, uh, to not cause suffering to, to people who had surrendered. And there are a couple of examples or a couple of things I want to point out to you. One of the earliest examples of paroling occurred uh, in September of 1861 at the Little Battle of Lexington in Missouri. Earlier, we talked about the importance of this battle. Uh, as a result of it, or it was part of that whole confusion over whether or not Missouri would go one way or the other. And in the process of things, this battle at Lexington, Missouri was a Confederate victory. That's why you see the Confederate flag flying there. But the row upon row of soldiers that you see are Union soldiers who have surrendered at Lexington and they were paroled. Um, and, uh, but it was not a formal thing. That is to say, uh, the Lincoln government didn't recognize the validity of the paroling, but instead uh, it was an informal thing where the agreement was basically that these men would uh, either go into a camp in the North or they would go and go home and await uh, an exchange with an equal number of Confederates. What happened to these men is tragic. Uh, because the Lincoln government didn't recognize the parole, many of them were uh, put right back into the army. And quite a number of these men participated in the Battle of Shiloh in April of 1862. And when the Battle of Shiloh was over with, a dozen or so of these men were, uh, were captured. And as it turned out, they were recognized by, uh, by Missouri soldiers uh, who had accepted their surrender. And several of these men were in turn executed for having violated the paroles. So paroling was a humane thing, but part of paroling said that you do not participate until you have been exchanged. And since these men had not been exchanged, the punishment for violating your parole, if caught, if captured, was execution. And so several of those men were executed immediately after the Battle of Shiloh. So it was still a question that was up in the air 
what, uh, what can we do about paroling? And that became a severe crisis in February of 1862. This is before Shiloh. But the reason it became a severe crisis is because at Fort Donaldson in February of 1862, Ulysses S. Grant accepted the surrender of 15,000 Confederate soldiers. 15,000 Confederate soldiers surrendered at the battle uh, at Fort Donaldson. And then Grant was faced with a situation. What do you do with 15,000 soldiers when you cannot uh, parole them? And the North had anticipated this and they had built several uh, facilities, old camps, a couple of old forts, um, uh, a penitentiary that had been uh, abandoned uh, as possible holding pens for uh, Confederates uh, should they surrender. But nobody had anticipated 15,000 men surrendering. And so all of a sudden uh, across the North, they were set up about a dozen prison camps and these 15,000 men were parceled out among them along with others. And then very quickly, additional uh, uh, soldiers began to come into these camps because in April, you have the Battle of Shiloh and uh, at least 3,000 Union soldiers were captured at Shiloh and they were sent to Northern uh, uh, holding pens or, or POW camps to await uh, their fate, which hopefully would be paroling. And then a few weeks later, you have what's called the Peninsula Campaign, southeast of Richmond, some uh, part of which was the Seven Days Battle. And again, another three or 4,000 uh, soldiers, Union soldiers, I'm sorry, Confederate soldiers were captured and sent north. And now all of a sudden you have large numbers of men in places like Camp Douglas, Johnson Island in, uh, in Erie, uh, Lake Erie, and uh, uh, the conditions were horrible. And men were dying uh, like flies. And at that point, the Lincoln government felt sufficient pressure that it became necessary to formalize a means of exchange. And in fact, there were enough Confederate, there were enough Union men in Confederate control uh, that you could do that. You could work out a system where you could parole these men and exchange them uh, rank for rank, man for man. And that led to a formal uh, declaration of how we will parole. In other words, how we will clean out these prison camps, which clearly immediately became uh, uh, overwhelmingly unfortunate places for people to be. And that led in July of 1862 to um, the one thing Lincoln did not wish to do, but had to do out of necessity. And what he had to do out of necessity was to come to an agreement with the Confederate States of America on how to exchange prisoners. And so Major General John A. Dixon, who we're probably not as familiar with, and um, Confederate General Major, uh, Major General Daniel H. Hill, who um, uh, has been more remembered because of these, some other things he did during the Civil War. Uh, but these two men were allowed to meet uh, at a small uh, village, really, on the banks of the James River. The James River is the river that goes through Richmond and on into an estuary, and eventually you get uh, into the Atlantic Ocean. And they met in a neutral spot, and after negotiating, they came up with what's called the Dixon Hill Cartel. And the Dixon Hill Cartel was a formal <clears throat> agreement on where and how to exchange soldiers. Uh, in other words, where would be a neutral place in the East uh, and where would be a neutral place in the West where, uh, where you could exchange soldiers. And they also came up with a system. Now the system was actually based on what had happened in the War of 1812 and what happened again during the Mexican War. And um, I love it, the, the means of it, 
a currency, for lack of a better term, that's the way I refer to it. The means of currency were privates. In other words, one private counted as one private. But then as you have a grading scale up in rank, uh, what if you have a corporal and no corresponding corporal? Well, a corporal is worth two privates. And you continue up to sergeants, lieutenants, uh, majors, captains, uh, or captains, majors, colonels, uh, brigadier generals, uh, major generals, and actually commanding generals. But a major general was worth 40 privates. Major general is worth 40 privates. And a commanding general, they, they didn't ever exchange any commanding generals, but a commanding general uh, was worth 60 privates. So the currency became a private. And I, I find that interesting at least, if not amusing. But, um, but it worked. It worked so well that within about six weeks, those awful prison camps in the North, and it was mainly prison camps in the North at this time, uh, were virtually empty. Uh, the only people that were left behind in those camps were, were the sick who were being treated because they simply didn't have the energy or the ability uh, to be uh, transferred back either north or south. And so this Dixon Hill cartel worked and, uh, and relieved the pressure and was a very humane thing that happened. The problem was it didn't last very long. That's July of 1862 but this system is going to break down and it's gonna break down very rapidly. And when it did break down, it, uh, uh, it had the negative effect uh, of, uh, I'm just looking at that. I'm, I'm a terrible speller and I've got a feeling that I based that spelling on uh, Mr. Fowler and not, not on correct spelling. I'll check it later. Uh, but anyway, the prison camps, um, uh, Johnson Island is one of them you see up there. That's in Lake Erie. That was for a union uh, for Confederate officers. But uh, once that cartel system broke down, as it did early in 1863, then from that point forward, uh, most soldiers that surrendered faced the, uh, the horrendous situation of having to experience life in a prison camp. One of my veterans, Joseph P.J. Hoover, one of the more bitter of my veterans, um, had an interesting experience different from the others. And his interesting experience was that for a brief period of time, he guarded prisoners, he guarded Union prisoners. And then later, he will end up at Rock Island Prison Camp uh, in the American North. And I'd like to share with you his observation as he looked at what is called Bell Island. Uh, in Richmond, Virginia, there was a prison camp called Libby Prison. It was an old warehouse, but it very quickly filled up. And having no better place to send prisoners, uh, there were islands in the James River, the most notorious of them being Bell Island. And because it was an island, which made sure that the men had a difficult time escaping, um, Union prisoners were kept for the most part exposed to the weather. And uh, here's, here's uh, Joseph Hoover's observation. He said uh, he was from the Army of Tennessee, which means he was participating in the Western Theater, but he was wounded at the Battle of Chickamauga, uh, which was in September of 1862. And when he had recovered enough that he was ambulatory and had some strength, but wasn't right, ready to serve in combat, he was uh, given orders to accompany prisoners to Richmond and to guard them for until he was healthy enough to return to his unit to fight in combat. Mm -hmm. And here's what he said. I was sent to Richmond, Virginia to guard some prisoners that were captured in Mississippi. I had permission to inspect the Libby prison thoroughly and there were not room for any more prisoners uh, there were so many, uh, so we carried them across the James River to prison camps. I saw these camps on that island, referring to Bell Island, wishing in my mind that every Yankee on God's green earth right there on that island 
where we would have them and make them sue for peace. I must acknowledge that they were somewhat crowded, but I would to God that they had crowded a million times more. It would have suited me better that way. Uh, here's a man, you know, he's in his late 70s, perhaps early 80s. Uh, the median age was 79 for these men. Uh, and uh, he still feel that, uh, that sense of hatred. We have this myth in American history that uh, the moment that the war was over with, the blue and the gray, they hugged each other uh, and, um, and forgave each other and, uh, and the nation healed. That simply is not the case. The nation didn't heal that quickly. Just look at it today, we still haven't healed that quickly as it relates to the American Civil War. And uh, uh, Mr. Hoover, this Tennessee soldier, who late in life filled up one of the Civil War veterans questionnaires, he hadn't healed. But after about a month, he was sufficiently healthy that he returned to his unit in time to participate in, um, in the campaign around Chattanooga. And in fact, he participated in the Battle of Missionary Ridge as a Confederate. And what happens in the Battle of Missionary Ridge is that the Confederates at the base of Missionary Ridge were overrun by the Union soldiers. They were captured, if not killed. And uh, here's his response to what happened to him as a result of that. At the base of Missionary Ridge, the blamed Yankees got possession of all the ditches and, and, and they'd taken three of us prisoners. We were marched off, to the, uh, off the ridge to the old train car shed or depot in Chattanooga and put onto an old box car and shipped like hogs to Rock Island. Shipped like hogs to Rock Island. In other words, he had no sympathy for the, uh, for the Yankee prisoners, the Union prisoners on Bale Island but he resented the fact that he and his fellows were shipped like hogs to Rhode Island. So why? Why did the cartel break down? Well, there are two major reasons it broke down. And uh, the first of these has to do with, uh, with the coming of black soldiers. Blacks uh, participated in the Union Army. About 179,000 uh, participated in the Army, an additional 11,000 participated in, um, uh, in the Navy. So a total of just under 190,000 uh, African Americans participated, many of whom uh, had been slaves. And so even before Lincoln granted the Emancipation Proclamation, remember the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation is in September, and it goes into effect January 1, 1863. But uh, months before that, Congress was already taking action that would lead to blacks participating in the Civil War. And uh, in July, Congress passed, the United States Congress passed two pieces of legislation that made this possible. The first was the Confiscation Act of July 1862. And in the Confiscation Act of July 1862, um, uh, basically what Congress said was, uh, slaves whose masters were giving aid to the Confederacy, who were soldiers or political officers in the Confederacy, uh, were free. Now that's not quite as free as the Emancipation Proclamation. But in other words, because they were property and because they were being used by masters who were committing in their view, treason, uh, the, the, it was all right to confiscate the property, meaning the slaves. At that point, you then passed the Militia Act of 1862 in July. And the Militia Act was an attempt to deal with a serious problem. And the serious problem was by June of 1862, there were hardly any volunteers for the Union Army. The same thing was true in the Confederacy. By June of 1862, there were hardly any volunteers in the Confederacy. In a future lecture, we're gonna deal with that and see how both sides tried to deal 
with getting sufficient numbers of people to fight the war. But in the North, one of the ways that they gained, they tried to find sufficient people to fight the war was the passage of the Militia Act of 1862, July 1862, that said that slaves whose masters were giving aid to the Confederacy would have the right of volunteering and serving in the Union Army. So beginning in July of 1862, it became legal for uh, the creation of what was called the U United States Military Colored Troops. The term colored troops was the terminology of the time. So you created what was called the United States Military Colored Troops. And now you're going to have blacks in uniform, blacks fighting for their freedom, so to speak. Well, from the perspective of us today, that might not be a bad thing. But from the perspective of the American South, you have an ideological problem. Let me review. Abraham Lincoln had a problem with paroling because if he acknowledged the need for formal paroling, it acknowledged the Confederacy. Now the Confederacy has a problem. What if you capture black troops? What does that mean? Well, Jefferson Davis issued a proclamation. It was a very simple proclamation. Any black soldier who is captured will be treated as if he was engaged in a servile uh, a servile, servile insurrection. And the punishment for a servile insurrection was either you were sold back into slavery or you were executed. So in other words, Jefferson Davis said, we will not accept black prisoners. Blacks who are captured and if they're wearing a, a union uniform, they will either be executed or they will be sold back into slaves because they are slavery because they are slaves. That was the Confederacy's position, but it was more than that. Any white officer who is commanding these people and the officers were white, any white officer who is commanding black troops will be treated as a leader of an insurrection and they will be executed. Any white officer leading black troops who are captured will be treated as leading a servile, execute, uh, servile insurrection and they will be executed. That was the Confederate ideology. That was the Confederate position. So how do you deal with that if you're Abraham Lincoln? And the answer is in July of 1863, Abraham Lincoln uh, issues general order number 252. And basically he said, don't you dare do either of those things. Don't sell blacks back into slavery and don't execute either blacks or union officers. Because if you do, according to general order 252, here's what Lincoln said. The government of the United States will give the same protection to all its soldiers. And if the enemy shall sell or enslave anyone because of his color, the offense shall be punished by retaliation upon the enemy's prisoners in our possessions. It is therefore ordered that every soldier of the United States killed in violation of the law, a rebel soldier shall be executed. And for everyone enslaved by the enemy or sold into slavery, a rebel soldier shall be placed at hard labor on the public works. In other words, a tit for tat, you know, don't even think about executing or enslaving black soldiers. Don't even think about executing um, uh, white officers of black units, because if you do, we will retaliate in the following way. What happened essentially is this as a result of that. The Confederacy backed down. That is to say the Confederate government uh, never enslaved a black soldier and uh, it never executed a white officer. On the other hand, the Confederate government did not take black prisoners. In the entire Civil War, 179,000 fought in the army, blacks fought in the army. Of that number, a total of 800 blacks were put into a prison camp. 
by the way, their death rate was 38%, 38%. The death rate in general was 18%, but of those 800 soldiers uh, who did end up black soldiers in prison camps, their death rate was 38%. Now, what I'm gonna say next cannot be proven. Certainly would be denied by many, but uh, it appears to be, and I mentioned the word appears to be, uh, the Confederate solution. Don't take black prisoners. And there were several battles. Uh, the battle of, uh, well, the, the Arkansas campaign of 1864, uh, in which several Union soldiers, the black soldiers, uh, were captured. And, uh, and the majority of those black soldiers uh, did not survive the experience. In other words, uh, they were killed in battle at a much higher rate than the white soldiers were killed in battle. In fact, uh, many of them were killed by simply taking them out of the woods and executing them. And of course, you have the infamous incident at Fort Pillow uh, in Western Tennessee, in which again, uh, a, a fort with about an equal number of whites and blacks captured, but the number of blacks that survived the experience was very small because during the night after the battle was fought, it was fought late in the afternoon, small groups of blacks were taken out in the woods and you heard gun, gunfire and they simply disappeared. And then of course, when you have the Battle of the Crater at Petersburg in 1864 and, uh, and blacks suddenly become a, a significant portion of that battle, the Confederate troops were saying, uh, except the white troops, kill all the blacks. Of course, they didn't use the word blacks, but, uh, but kill all the blacks. And again, it was a massacre of black soldiers. So it was never the formal policy of the Confederacy to massacre black troops. Uh, and it's impossible to, uh, to connect that in any way to, uh, to the whole issue of what do you do. But in example after example after example, uh, black soldiers simply were not taken prisoner. Okay. Um, so let's move on. Let's talk about the prison camps themselves. And um, for the most part, I'm gonna look at the Union camps through the eyes of my Confederate veterans. And then we will uh, turn to the infamous camp of Andersonville. But let me say this before we do that. In the North, there were some prison camps that were quite infamous. The most notable of these uh, was Elmira along the border between Pennsylvania and New York, Elmira, New York. Uh, its death rate was significantly higher, 26%, uh, nearly a quarter of the soldiers that, served, uh, that were in prison there died. Um, and that came pretty close to the death rate at Andersonville, which was 28%. Uh, Another camp that was uh, rather infamous was Rock Island Camp, uh, which was uh, in the far western corner of uh, Illinois. And, uh, and the death rate there was particularly high and the living conditions were, well, the living conditions and all of them were horrible, but they were particularly bad at Rock Island. On the other hand, uh, Camp Chase down in Ohio, uh, just outside of Columbia, Ohio, um, it was one of the better camps. Uh, soldiers fortunate enough, I say fortunate enough, unfortunate enough to be at Johnson's Island. It was relatively mild. And so some of the camps were better run than others. Um, and some of them, uh, they were all unfortunate situations, but, uh, but you have terrible examples in Elmira and uh, uh, Elmira and Rock Island and less terrible, but terrible nonetheless conditions in the other prison camps. Of course, in the South, the camp that everybody points to is Andersonville. And that was as close to hell on earth as you could probably get. But the reason for that has to do with climate and location. In both the North and the South, the primary criteria for a prison camp was transportation and security. In other words, where can you put these soldiers where they're unlikely to escape, where, where we can get them there relatively easily? And, um, uh, and then after that, 
conditions and food and all the other stuff was very definitely secondary. So that when you get to, and that was the problem at Elmira, that was the problem at uh, Rock Island, um, both of these places with excellent transportation and unlikely places where uh, the soldiers would be freed by, by Confederate forces. And in the case of the South, the location of Andersonville, uh, excellent for transportation. You had rail connections, you could get the, uh, the prisoners there. Um, likely out of the way of where a Union Army might appear and in point of fact, it ended up being out of the way. It was never liberated. Uh, it only ended with the end of the war. Uh, but the problem with Andersonville was it was built on what essentially was marshy ground. And uh, so it was secure. It was easy to get the soldiers there to transport them. But the conditions based on the ground and in both the North and the South, you have a problem with climate. Northern soldiers weren't used to the hot, humid, mosquito infested climate of the South. And I'll give you a clue, as a Southerner, I'm not used to the hot, humid, mosquito-ridden climate of the South. But uh, uh, certainly that was true of Northern soldiers who came uh, to have the unfortunate experience of serving in prison camps in the South in general and Andersonville in particular. By contrast, Southern soldiers, typically wearing their relatively light uniforms, found themselves in Northern prison camps uh, where they had never seen weather much below freezing, let alone 30 degrees below freezing, where the initial uh, Southern soldiers that ended up in uh, Rock Island experienced. In other words, you come from Chattanooga where they were captured and 10 days later, you're introduced to Rock Island prison and there's a blizzard going on and the blizzard dropped down to 30 degrees below zero and you're outside being processed in your light Southern outfits. It was a horror. That's all the way you can explain it. It was a horror. So what causes the problems both North and South? We're gonna be looking at Northern camps, but everything I say about the Northern camps would also apply to the Southern camps. One problem was simply bureaucracy. And what I mean by that is prison camps had not existed before, okay? They had not existed before. And because they had not existed before, you don't have people who are experienced running prison camps. And not only that, but you, uh, uh, you don't dedicate your better administrators to running prison camps. Your better administrators are needed to run railroads. Your better administrators are needed to, to get the logistical support to support the, uh, uh, the, uh, the soldiers in the field and the campaigning soldiers that are trying to defeat the enemy, whether that enemy is a Southern enemy or a Northern enemy. And that was certainly the case uh, of the Northern prison camps in the Civil War. Uh, the principal director of, um, of the Northern prison camps was a Colonel William Hoffman. William Hoffman was not a bad guy. He was a career officer, graduate of West Point, 1829. He was an engineer. One of the reasons he got his position was because he knew how to build barracks and he knew how to put up a fort on the Western frontier. And so the assumption was that uh, securing barracks and building forts and running prison camps all would be the same thing. And so he was put in charge of all the prison camps across the North. Unfortunately, he was uh, a man of uh, uh, integrity, no question about that. But he was a man of, um, he lacked imagination. That's the easiest way I can say it. Um, you know, sometimes when you're talking about students that aren't making it, uh, a phrase that we would often use is they lack imagination. Uh, there are other harsher things you could say, but lacking imagination is polite. He lacked imagination. And in fact, 
his most endearing characteristic as far as the uh, northern northern bureaucracy was concerned. He was a man dedicated to frugalness. He was personally frugal. Uh, in fact, he was known uh, even in the military as being a man of, uh, how shall I say it, very careful with his own personal finances and careful with the finances of the United States government, which means he's going to run, run the prison camps in the North with uh, very frugal policies. Now, was he trying to harm the Confederates? No, but I'll give you one example that'll illustrate the point. And the point I'll give you is El Mara, that infamous prison camps that by far had the largest number of deaths in, uh, uh, in the Northern camps. Uh, among the things happening at El Mara was a large pond that needed to be drained because, well, it was a place that uh, uh, all the sinks with the waste, meaning the waste from the soldiers and the waste from everything else, uh, they tended to go into the pond. And inspectors, the northern camps were inspected, the southern camps were inspected as well. The inspectors that went there smelled the stink. It stank horribly. Now, the knowledge of disease at the time said that disease is caused by foul air. It's called marasma. It's Greek for foul air or stinking air. And the assumption was that when you, everywhere you find stinking air, you find disease, which is kind of true. So what you need to do is to get rid of the stink. And so the recommendation was that you drain the pond and, and therefore drain the source of the stinking. Now, the result is actually you drain the pond and conditions get healthier, but they didn't understand why. Well, Heath uh, Hoffman said that's too big an expense. And so he did not approve the digging of a ditch to drain the pond. At that point, some 325 men had already died uh, of diseases that were associated with uh, typhus and dysentery. When another 1,200 men died, Hoffman finally agreed to allow them to drain the pond, but he only gave them a fraction of the money necessary to do it correctly, to do it adequately. And eventually the death rate at Almara uh, was far in excess of what it should have been. And, um, and again, it has more to do with a lack of imagination a lack of experience understanding when men are brought together and the conditions that exist and the results of those conditions, Hoffman simply was an inadequate person to do a job that nobody understood, least of all himself. On the other hand, weather played a major role in, um, in what happened to these men. And I bring it back to my friend Joseph E. Riley, the, the Civil War soldier that of all the men that I study, uh, he and maybe two or three others, I would love to have a bull session with, but of course, it's not quite possible. But um, in the case of Riley, he was also captured at Chattanooga. And he arrives um, not on the day, December the 7th, uh, when the temperature hit 30 degrees below zero, uh, the weather had warmed a little bit by the time that he arrived on the 10th of December. And of course, look what he says. We kept busy pounding ourselves, walking and running to keep from freezing. And when lethargic comrades began to die, we used whatever means at hand to arouse their, their lagging spirits and dormant circulations. In other words, you get these Southern soldiers still dressed in November in light uniforms and you put them into a temperature situation along or really in the middle of the Mississippi River and, um, and they were freezing to death. And even what, uh, it, it took a long time to acclimate your body to the kind of climate that exists in the North. As a teenager, I lived in Jefferson City, Missouri. And I can tell you after five years, I never acclimated. And you'll notice that my entire teaching career was either in Tennessee or in Texas. Um, I'm not fond of northern winters. Disease. Tremendous numbers of northern soldiers, tremendous numbers of southern soldiers 
died in disease in these prison camps. The truth of the matter is tremendous numbers died in camp. And when you have your contraband camps uh, of, of you know, slaves that have run away and they're living near, near the uh, Union Army camps, the death rate is very high. But it's high because no one understood the concept of disease in 1861, 62, 63, 64, 65. The concept of the germ theory is still half a decade away beginning roughly in 1872. The concept of viruses didn't exist at all. There was some knowledge about disease, but, uh, but the prevailing theory was that uh, it's about, all about stinking. That uh, if you have rot, if you have stench, that must be the cause of the disease. And so a lack of knowledge about how diseases are spread, a lack of knowledge that when you pressed together 5,000, 10,000, 15, 20,000 men into a relatively small space, that these men are gonna be infecting each other with diseases and with vermin and with lice. Um, that concept simply didn't exist. And the result was an amazing and awful death rate. And here's uh, Joseph Hoover again, the fellow that was particularly bitter. And he said that of his experience at Rock Island, I was sent to the pest hospital and about a million or more cooties chased each other up and down my spine. And now and then they stopped to dig into my smallpox sores. He was having a miserable experience. Well, he survived, he survived. But 12% of the Confederates in Northern prison camps didn't survive and 18% of the prisoners in Southern prison camps did not survive. And most of them died of dysentery, typhus, smallpox, or just being weakened by the conditions that brought on their captivity and of wounds that they brought with them and of just not being able to deal with the diseases that existed. Malnutrition became a problem. Um, allow me to brag. In the last 18 months, I've lost 100 pounds. But not only have I lost 100 pounds, I'm also eating a balanced diet, which I didn't do for about three years. And I feel better. But at least we understand the importance of nutrition in our modern age. To someone living in Civil War America, nutrition was a full belly. Uh, a full stomach. And uh, these men sometimes got rations, but it lacked a variety and it lacked uh, a nutritional value. And so in both Northern and Southern prison camps, starvation caused these men to do some really strange things. But among the things they did, they killed rats. Now that was the one thing that was abundant in all of the prison camps, Northern and Southern. And, and killing rats became a supplement that many of these men made to deal with their starvation. Uh, <clears throat> not Joseph Riley, but another one of my veterans uh, made a small crossbow. And he, he talked about how in the evening, uh, it was both entertaining for him and a supplement to his nutrition by using that crossbow uh, to kill rats. But, uh, but Joseph Riley was particularly proud of his experiences with rats, and I share that with you. I prepared rat broiled, rat stew, and once rat and dumplings. These feasts are pleasant memories to this day yet. They broke the monotony of prison life and to play host to a rat dinner, which relieved your comrades of that awful torture of gnawing hunger and gave you consciousness of having done well. So he saw the opportunity to kill rats, not so much for its nutritional value, but for its entertainment and its morale value. But nonetheless, desperate men were dealing with what they had to deal with in the prison camps. And related to what he just said, Riley also pointed out the problem of boredom, which led to melancholia. And many of these men suffering this kind of melancholia actually just gave up the will to live. 
just gave up the will to live. As Riley said, you may imagine the awful torture we endured, the monotony of prison life with nothing to read, no news from the outside, and the realization that you could not help yourself. The realization that you could not help yourself. And then there were a miscellany of other things. North or South, nobody liked their guards. In fact, uh, to quote R.H. R.W. Mickey, who uh, was at Camp Look, uh, Lookout in Maryland, uh, he said of his Union guards, some of whom were Black, I don't think there is a place in hell hot enough for those men. So the prison experience, the prison experience was overall one of the worst experiences the combatants faced in the American Civil War. And a man who faced the worst of these, grandson lives in my hometown in Abilene, great-grandson lives in my hometown of Abilene, Texas. And he was kind enough to loan me a copy, a transcript of his great-grandfather diary. And I'm just going to share a few things that the man saw that were particularly potent as it related to Andersonville. Here is diary entries for uh, July 28 and July 29. He was fixated on food. He was also fixated on the weather and he was fixated on how bad conditions were around him. So on July 28, 1864, having been in prison now for a little over a month, he wrote, today's been a warm day. 1,000 prisoners were brought in today and our rations was a pint of meal and a teaspoon of salt and a bit of meat, okay? And then what happens the next day? Pretty much the same thing. Today's been a warm day and there were about a thousand prisoners coming in today and our rations were a pint of meal and a bit of salt. Ah, I see what my problem is. You know what my problem is? I put the same entry in twice. There was a slight difference and it was important. And right now I forgot what it was, but that's okay. When he entered Andersonville, it was a camp made for 10,000. When he entered it, there were 18,000 there. And then as he was pointing out in his first entry, an early entry, he said they're coming in 20 and 30 men a day, but now they're coming in a thousand men a day. He was getting very cramped at Andersonville. And naturally what happened? On June 16th, about the time that he entered the camp, he said, today's been another disagreeable day, very wet. And remember, they had almost no shelters at Andersonville, very wet. And it's uh, rained every day this month and about 20 or 30 dies every day. But then two months later in August, he wrote, today's been a warm day, been warm. There's about a hundred men dies every day. And our rations are beef, beans, salt, and bread, a very small amount as well, a very small amount to T-O-O instead of T-O. But at Andersonville, and really the other camps as well, but particularly at Andersonville, another problem was that discipline broke down. It became a kind of Darwinian situation where the strong fed on the weak, and there were a lot of weak people in the prison camps. And so look what he writes about. He says, this day has been warm. We are, are, A-R, we are still in Andersonville. And it's a very hard place to stay in. There is raiders that is stealing all the time. In other words, some of the stronger Union soldiers were taking advantage of the weaker Union soldiers by stealing uh, what few possessions and more importantly, what little food the weaker men had. And then two days later, look what he writes. Today has been wet. And there were some of our boys brought in today. There was two or three men killed in here today. And the Raiders killed one for his money, but they got put up. In other words, they got caught. And as a result of that, on July 11th, he said, today is another warm day. Some rain fell today. I saw six of our prisoners hung today in there, they was hung for murdering others. 
And so a state of anarchy was developing at Andersonville, which was horrendously overcrowded. Interestingly enough, about 20 miles to the west was another Confederate prison camp. And at that Confederate prison camp, it was one of the better camps because it wasn't in a marsh and because the administration was stronger and it wasn't quite as overcrowded. Uh, so the camps varied in the south, just like they varied in the north. But by any standard, Andersonville was by far the worst camp north or south. Well, as we deal with Andersonville, let's have a little coda. By April of 1862, or sorry, by April of 1865, the war is coming to an end. Lee surrendered in early April. And shortly after that, uh, Joseph E. Johnston's army surrendered in North Carolina. And by June, all of the Confederate armies will have surrendered. But even before the surrender, paroling had been restored as a humane thing, both North and South. And so the soldiers that were at Andersonville and a few other prison camps, the Union soldiers were marched to Vicksburg. And in Vicksburg, they began to be transferred to the North and to home. And one of the, one of the steamboats, the Sultana, you have a situation of corruption. The Union officer in charge of, of repatriating the men was notoriously corrupt. And part of his corruption was that he began to put as many soldiers on the steamboats as could be packed on there because he got a kickback from the captains. And so the Sultana, which was rated for 300 passengers, had over 2,700 men on board. And the vast majority of the people on board had uh, were survivors of Andersonville and a couple of other prison camps. And then that steamboat began chugging north. And at about two o'clock in the morning on April 27, 1865, about eight miles north of Memphis, the boilers exploded. And there was panic and there was death. And the Mississippi River was frigid. And so there was hypothermia. And when it all settled out, a little over 1,700 men and women, fewer women, 1,700 men and women died on the Sultana. It is the single largest maritime accident in peacetime, because technically this was not a military action um, in history. More people died on the Sultana than died on the Titanic. But because it was at the end of the war and the war was break, uh, going down, because Lincoln had been assassinated and that covered the news, much of what happened to the Sultana has drifted away from the consciousness of the American people. But here you have 2,700 people, many of whom survived the worst of all the prison camps at Andersonville, who perished on the Sultana on their way to home. Well, I hope this lecture has at least given you an insight as to an element of the Civil War. And uh, by the way, next week, we're gonna have two lessons and I'll also be going from my cabin. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I hope to be able to lecture from there. Uh, Misha, how about, uh, or Shelby, whichever, let's, uh, let's talk for a minute. Well, does anybody have any questions or comments? Anyone, anyone? <laughs> see if I can enlarge. Um, well, I'll say, I'll say one thing. I have a letter from one of my relatives um, who was in a prison camp, but it was, I'm thinking that he was court-martialed he was at uh, the military prison, Jefferson City, Missouri. Oh, I know exactly where he was. So he uh, talks about being there without a trial and 
and but he didn't like the guards either and he said when he got <laughs> out of there they could all go to you know <laughs> Well, if it's of interest to you, uh, he would have been located in, uh, in the spot that, well, now it's a museum, it's been decommissioned, but the, uh, but the prison, uh, there is a, a state prison in, in Jefferson City. And uh, in my teen years, that's where I grew up. Not, not in the prison, but uh, in Jefferson City. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so I know exactly where he was and I know a little bit about the prison during the Civil War. And, um, uh, and, and it was not a POW camp. It was, uh, um, it was military. a military, it was a military prison camp. Yeah. Now that's yeah. not to comment on, on your guilt or innocence of your, your relative, because a lot of people were court-martialed and many of them just because somebody didn't like them. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, that, that interests me because I'm, I can picture where well, you are. Uh, yeah. I was, I was, trying to send this to Misha, but it's in a decommissioned phone. So oh, okay. one, uh, one thing that interested me was his uh, spelling and grammar are similar to the letters that you were showing or the diary entries that you were showing. Both. He, he said, um, uh, he said, I can't hardly see to write. He was talking about his eyes hurting him he said I can't hardly see to write but maybe so you can read it and maybe so is all one word mm -hmm. yeah okay you <laughs> might you might remember from an earlier series when I talked about uh, uh, the culture that these men are coming out of and there was one lecture where I dealt with uh, the difference in education between the north and the south um, the North was slightly more literate than the South, but only so. Uh, approximately 90% of the people in the North were literate. Uh, a little over 80% of the whites in the South were literate. Uh, and I mentioned whites because literacy among the slaves and literacy among the blacks was less than 1%. Uh, and then there's a whole different thing that occurs during reconstruction, but that's for a future lecture. But having said that, most education North and South uh, taught you how to read phonetically and have taught you how to spell phonetically. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, and this is from my Civil War veterans in the questionnaires. Bella said, uh, uh, my, my teacher was so ignorant she couldn't even spell tobacco, lowercase T O capital B A K E R, tobacco. <laughs> and, uh, um, that's because they have what they call loud schools. And the teacher would say, A, and, they, and the students would shout back, A. The sound of A is ah, ah, and everybody shout ah. And you didn't have blackboards, you just had dirt. And then the students would practice writing in the dirt with a stick until they could uh, sound out the letters and come up with something that seemed to be readable. And so that's why when you read these letters, uh, people think, oh, my, my ancestor was ignorant. No, they were right. For their time, they were fairly well educated, but they wrote just like they spelled. And even when they read, uh, the spelling may be correct and everything's correct, but they still sounded things out phonetically. And, and uh, this is, as a social historian, that's one of the things that fascinates me. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think they, they want to know who um, Myrna wants to know who the uh, artist is for all the pictures in your PowerPoints. Um, oh, my goodness. Well, I don't know who the artist is for, for 90 percent of them. Um, uh, they're, they're just things I've gotten off the Internet. Now you wonder that doesn't look like anything I've seen before. That's because, you know, I'm retired. I've got time. And um, uh, so I use, a, it's, it's called, a, it's called a transparency. It, it's a little, it's not all that complicated, but it's complicated to explain where I remove background or things I want to in order to make them come out more. And so the illustrations are uh, many of them, most of them from the time from places like say uh, Harper's Weekly or something like that, 
or illustrations from a later time or whatever uh, that I've just simply adapted to my needs and adapted to, to letting them show show up more. Let me see. Uh, I'll just come back. Well, let's take that one. Uh, the image of the Union soldier there uh, is actually an image from uh, the 1890s uh, in a book about black soldiers. And, uh, but it has a lot of background to it that uh, I just wanted to emphasize him. So almost like using a pair of scissors, but I'm using the computer. I just cut away all his background and just placed him on there. And I did something similar with the deadline. That's called a deadline with the guards ready to shoot. Uh, where you see that pale yellow, I, I cut out all the clouds and stuff that would, would have been part of the 19th century imagery. Uh, and, and the same thing's true. In terms of intellectual honesty, uh, that is not a picture of R.W. Mickey because I only had like two pictures of all of those 1600 soldiers that I studied. Uh, so I just found pictures of old Confederates to represent those men. Those are the men's words, but not necessarily the men themselves. Okay. Myrna said, you have done a great job to share your content. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I'll be honest with you. I, I was up till about four o'clock this morning. So if I seem to hope, there's a reason. <laughs> <laughs> I was pushing it on this one. Uh, I'll tell you why I was pushing it, because it was always a fascinating topic to me. And the more I studied preparing for this, it was like, oh my goodness, I got to do it. I had a hard time cutting stuff out. I cut out 85% of what I could have put in here, but then we'd have been here for six or eight hours. And I didn't think you all would last that long. <laughs> Myrna said, dedicated speaker, thank you for all your efforts. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And by the way, I hope, I hope everybody has a good weekend, is able to be back with me next week. And then after that, we all have a great Christmas too, okay? Yes. I, I'm thankful for you all. You, in this time when we're not having as much contact with other people, when uh, in many ways we're experiencing some of the same psychological things that these prisoners felt, because we aren't being prisoners right now in our homes. Uh, this is for me a wonderful outlet to be able to share. And I appreciate y'all giving me the opportunity to do it. Well, if anybody else has any questions or anything um, that you wanna ask later, uh, you can always email me or Fred. Um, if you don't have his email address, I can share it with you later. Um, but thank you all for coming. And we'll have two sessions next week. Don't forget. And then we will be off for Christmas break. But stay tuned because our spring catalog is fixing to come out. Very good. It's going to be very good. So thank you all for coming. And you all have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Bye, y'all. Bye, Fred. Bye.